It's fixed. The image quality passes control. OK, so um, we're going to be a little disorganized, but we're going to try to motivate a continued discussion of dynamic topography and put it in the real world, con real world context of the Colorado Plateau, which has received a lot of attention with uh, vying models for the, uh, the modern day instantaneous sort of dynamic topography and its evolution over time, OK? So uh, I'm actually going to be channeling some of Jean Braun as best as I can. Uh, he and I were at a workshop a year ago, and he gave a nice talk about dynamic topography. So I have stolen some of his slides and incorporated them here. So thank you, Jean. OK, so <clears throat> some of these were mentioned. I'm going to first just show you, just to motivate things, a number of slides are going to go kind of fast of examples where people have seen evidence of dynamic topography or have tried to model its effects. Okay? So one of the places, and this was mentioned in terms of those Cretaceous seaways, is to explain a, that, that sedimentary record of why did you go submarine over through the whole central swath of, the, of North America for as long as you did back in the Cretaceous? And then why is it all sitting at such high elevation now? So these are um, Cretaceous isopacks, you know, thickness of uh, sedimentation in there. <clears throat> and this is all from a paper by, I cannot pronounce the name, Spazovic, Sp 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 maybe? Spazovic? I don't know. Um, uh, with uh, with uh, Gernis at Caltech. Spazovic. That sounds a little more realistic. Thank you. <laughs> right. So uh, here's some of the, uh, the solutions that, um, that she's showing in the paper. So first off, on this column right here is showing you temperature, but it, at different depths. So there, um, all these models are taking an image of the modern day tomography, doing something to transform from the, uh, um, the speed to density and then turning on gravity and, and letting it roll in a convection model, right? That's the basic idea. So <clears throat> these, are showing, these are showing you different depths getting deeper and deeper as we come down. So here's the present day image. This is what you see. And they are interpreting the velocities as density or um, temperature, right? So she's showing temperatures and, and showing you the laramide slab sitting out. Yeah, so this is temperature and cold is over here. I have no idea. It's, it's probably non-dimensionalized in some way anyhow. Anyway, cold to hot. Sorry. Uh, you can find the papers here. But this is supposed to be the Laramide slab. And then they run the simulation back, right? Turn on gravity with a uh, minus sign or something, right? So it rolls backwards in time as the slab comes up and back underneath the western US 90 million years ago. And so, and then in this image is showing you the predicted dynamic topography over time. So you were very depressed in the Western US with that cold slab, A, cold dense material underneath there, and B, heading down. So dragging uh, the surface down with it. And it runs across the continent, I mean this big depression then off so that the eastern seaboard is subsiding today, is the idea. Um, <clears throat> they use this plus the topography then to predict where are your zones of inundation. Okay, there's no crustal deformation in this, of course, so if you had a little mountain range sticking up, that would poke up. They're not trying to include the fact that you had the Sierra Nevada as an active arc at the time, right? But anyway, so those are their predictions. And the whole point, just to show you this, is that the sedimentary record, and, and same thing with the slave craton and stuff that Becky's work on, that record of exhumation and burial is a test to try your different simulation models and maybe really critical information deciding which are the better um, models of the uh, convective process, what's the viscosity structure, how important is the lateral viscosity structure, this sort of thing. And as I recall this figure, so this side is showing you the data. This is what's known about the extent of the seaway at different times through the uh, Cretaceous here, mostly. Um, <clears throat> and these are different model solutions with different um, 
with different viscosities uh, that are being used, just to show you the sensitivity to the viscosity structure. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of thinking about how this can influence um, geomorphology, I said I talk, everything I talked about this morning was pretty short wavelength, right? You've got a normal fault, a little fault range is popping up, or you've got a compressional origin. <clears throat> Dynamic topography is going to operate on you know much bigger scales in general, and maybe uplift large portions of an entire uh, continent. And here's a figure that um, um, Rob uh, Muka uh, developed from a map taking the, just the modern day instantaneous prediction for what the dynamic topography predictions for up and down are. And just plotted as a function of wavelength, what's the amplitude of dynamic topography, which is in the black line here. And in the gray line is what's the uplift rate you're feeling at the surface, okay? So the main point of this <coughs> being, you know, the, the wavelengths tend to be pretty large for big features, um, say 250 kilometers out here somewhere. And the uplift rates are quite low, right? In a couple of different ways. Um, Thorson said the other day, dynamic topography is static. We'll talk about that some more because it is, it's dynamic, but it's, uh, you're going to be in static equilibrium most any time. So in the modern day, Rob anyways, predicting uplift rates less than 10, millimeter, 10 meters per million years, this is like nothing. Right, that's the rate of chemical denudation in an area that's completely flat. So if you're only uplifting at that rate, you might not get any topography because you're going to erode at rates like that kind of high. There's almost no way to erode less than that unless you're in the dry valleys of Antarctica or something like that. <coughs> that the... Um, yeah, you know, why this peak is here, I, I... Well, you seem to be losing power at the longest wavelengths. Correct. Instead of emphasizing the shorter wavelengths, but in a non-linear fashion. Yes, I agree. And I don't know the, the ins and outs of what he's saying. The only point I wanted to make is that the rates are pretty low. And the amplitudes, obviously amplitudes can get to be near a kilometer. We've seen evidence of that. But I think this is the instantaneous rate, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. But, and the first point you made is, is very true. This is what I was trying to allude to with dynamic topography being um, static, right? In most places, the Earth is going to come into static equilibrium. So you may have dynamic topography, but it's not currently uplifting, right? It's already adjusted to the dynamic forces that are holding it up. So its current uplift rate is very low. I think that's part of the explanation. Um, and for sure, it's a, it's a smooth model, right? They use only a radial viscosity structure. And it's um, a global spherical harmonic model out to, I think, uh, degree 128. Um, and it starts from a smooth tomography, like you said. So it won't resolve small features. OK, so um, <clears throat> right, this is the, the slope that you might get coming off the sides of one of these highs if it's only up to 250 meters at a 4,000 kilo 4, kilometers distance. That's a tiny slope, right? That's not going to drive that much erosion, you wouldn't think. Um, at least not compared to the slopes of the rivers that I work on, right? Where the, the slope of the river is 10%, right? Um, but that is on the order of the same slope as most really big rivers. So it's enough that you could back tilt the Amazon River by far and deflect the flow. You could cause stream capture. All sorts of things can happen. You can get potentially large response, even though at first it seems like a tiny effect. Um, here's an example by the Caltech group, Shepard et al., um, with Garnis. 
Um, <clears throat> they're looking at the Amazon basin. And one of the uh, surprising things, you know, the Amazon is one of the world's biggest rivers. But apparently, the Amazon fan just starts building um, uh, around 10 million years ago. 10, 14, something like that. So many people have interpreted that as a sign of uplift of the Andes, generating a bunch of sediment and piling it onto the fan. But what they're pointing out is the Andes, I mean, the Amazon was actually trapped in a big wetland, and this is known geologically, up near the mountain front, and there was just no water, certainly no sediment coming out of that wetlands out here, regardless of what the Andes themselves and the erosion of the Andes was doing. You had a big hole that was trapping the water in the sediment. And then at some point, you know, when you're, you know, forget the times, so this is something like 14 million, where you um, integrate the Amazon River, it comes out, starts bringing all that sediment out, and dumps out into the fan. And so the argument that they're making is this is similar to the story I showed you just a second ago of North America. This is a subducting slab underneath um, pulling down this part and then moving across. And uh, at least that's the argument that um, this is the Andes with the black dot. And we're going um, through time. Old, so you can see the slab sinking down. And this, the big depression behind the Andes is here where the slab is near the surface and on its way down. Okay. Um, Anyway, it's kind of a, a cool example they've shown. Is it right? I don't know. What, what could be the role here of the, of the, of the relief of the Andes? Um, <clears throat> well, it is initially... The, the dynamic topography will affect, obviously, the mountain range as well as that, that basin four deep that's being created, so they will both rebound. There is a lot of evidence... Um, and the stuff I'm most familiar with is a little bit to the south here, more like 15 degrees south, that a lot of the Andes did come up around 10 million years ago. Um, and that that's when you started underthrusting the Brazilian shield and built the mountain range. So for sure, I think for sure something is going on there. There are other people that say it's equivocal and the Andes could have come up slow and steady from uh, 40 million years ago. Todd Ehlers argues that. Yeah, I'm familiar. There's a lot of evidence for that. So is that a possible influence on this? Uh... Um, it is a possible influence because it would add more sediment coming out of the system. It's also that this dynamic response could be feeding that crustal um, response that we're seeing as well. Right? So the two could be very tightly coupled. Um, okay. Okay, now here is another cool one, at least very suggestive. In this paper, they do not try to model the, the dynamic topography. Um, Hartley et al. This is um, published in Nature Geoscience just uh, a couple years ago, 2011. And they are looking at a site in this box just off the north coast of the, of the UK. And um, this is the Iceland plume coming up. Okay? So they're going to argue that what they see is driven by the dynamics of that plume but the, the main thing I want to show you is just the cool case that they see. Um, here is a little slice, a little vertical slice through a 3D seismic volume. Okay, there's lots of detailed 3D seismic data because there's lots of oil, right? Um, and this is relatively shallow in the section, so it's above the oil, so oil companies can be convinced to share the data. <laughs> um, but it is amazing what can be done with 3D seismic data these days, those seismic volumes. Um, and what they've done, as you can see, this is the interpretation here, but, um, and there's lots of drill holes, so it's pretty well controlled, that in blue, this is all um, marine sediments. Blue again, all marine sediments. A big dramatic erosional unconformity and a stack of terrestrial sediments on top. Okay? So something happened here. This was deep. It came high. It got eroded. It started going down, covered itself in terrestrial sediments, and then sunk under the sea. Right? So something indicates it was down, it came up, and it went back down in a relatively short time interval. Um, and that timing is known. I don't uh, recall it. The cool thing is this erosional unconformity right here, that surface makes a beautiful reflector, and you can pick it out in 3D, in that 3D volume. So they pick that surface, and here it is. 
rendered up. This is the topography of that uh, erosional unconformity. And, you know, what does it look like? It looks like an eroded landscape with fluvial drainage basins and tributaries. It looks just like a DEM. And so their argument, well, they, they go into quite some detail in their argument. I don't know if it's all believable or not, but they analyze the channel profiles, do the kind of stuff we do to try to figure out the uplift history. But the bottom line is that this was below the ocean. It came up so barely, it was, it was eroded out and then dropped back down. So two possibilities are a dynamic high sort of rolling, sweeping by underneath it, or something happening with the plume head spreading out and then cooling off. Um, you can read the paper. Uh, yeah, I believe you can exclude crustal tectonics here. Yeah, there's, there's no plate boundary nearby. Uh, no, that's true, and you know I, their argument has to do with that plume, and that would do some underplating. So um, anyway, I just wanted to show you the case of a, something that has gone up and down in a fairly quick order, and that's fairly well uh, recorded with that. Um, okay, I'm just going to flash at this slide. This is another one by. You can do it. <laughs> no, I cannot. I can do it instantly after. Um, Pasojevich. Very good. I like that. That sounds cool. Um, anyway, so they're looking at the eastern seaboard of the U.S. I showed you the other case where the Laramide slab is now off board of the eastern U.S. It should be overall subsiding it. So this is the change in dynamic topography in the last 50 million years. Okay, so they're saying the whole western U.S. has gone up roughly 500 meters over that whole time scale in this model and the eastern U.S. is going down by 100 meters or something like that. And so they were interested to look at the shorelines as you march off across through this package of um, um, marine sediments. And they look at the Eocene coastline and the Miocene coastline, and they kind of do this analysis of the substance. Okay? Now, the reason I'm showing you this one is partly because to set up the Colorado problem, there's a big war going on between the Caltech group and their models and um, the Montreal group of Alex Forte and uh, Rob Mutka and their models. And they tend to predict the dead opposite, and they both think the other, they, I think they respect each other as scientists, but they don't like their models. So um, let me show you what the, has just been published by, um, uh, uh, by that group working with David Rowley, the geologist on the case. They're looking at the same problem along here, but to look at Pliocene shorelines okay, on a younger time scale. And they noticed, um, and probably their attention was drawn to it by that other paper, but those shorelines, which run right along through here, they've got little blue dots, which is a bad choice because you can hardly see them. They should be orange or bright red or something. Um, and then this little black line is a continuous shoreline. Okay, So here is the those shorelines, they're just three million years old, show a significant warp along them as you go up and down that coast. The reason these guys are really passionate about it, and Jerry Mitrovica has been his entire career, is what can we say about eustatic sea level? And how do you know you have a good, robust datum which to know what eustatic sea level is doing? And the whole idea has been, well, passive margins, nice, perfectly stable, so any change in sea level is eustatic. Not true at all in many different ways that uh, if you know Jerry, you know all about it. Um, anyway, so this shoreline, three million years old, has you know, up to about 60 meters of deformation on it. Okay? So actually, I don't have to go to another plot. In the background, these contours, 50 meters here, 40, 30, 20, those are their predicted uplift pattern from their model. Okay? So they would have the, the western U.S., broadly speaking, in a subsiding zone because the Laramide slab going underneath it. But at a shallow level, they see some uh, low-velocity blobs that are telling them there's some dynamic uplift happening locally that's overprinted on the big signature. And here that pattern is color-coded here. So they see a big kind of bullseye of uplift in this point. Their bullseye is occurring at 36 degrees. 
The peak in this might be at 34, so it's a little bit off in magnitude. I'd say their prediction is something like this. But it's aligning with that pattern pretty well. So, um, and here's the actual dynamic topography they're predicting at the present day. So the arrows show you the horizontal component of motion, just to show the orientation. Oh, it also shows you the horizontal velocities. So this is barely moving at all. And the color code here is showing you the vertical component. Right? So this is this upwelling here of stuff in the upper 300 kilometers of the ocean above that Laramide slab. They would argue, of course, that this is the proof in the pudding that their model is better because it resolves this, whereas the other model does not. Um, I'm sure there'll be a paper soon with the counter argument. Okay, so, oh, now I wanted to speak to this and we're gonna look at some slides from Jean. Yes. Yes. Now, I, I feel like I have understood that bottom line, that it comes down to this battle of is convection fundamentally active or is it fundamentally completely passive? Right? At least that's my understanding. You guys can correct me. So I've had the sense that the Caltech group is firmly on convection is entirely passive, so only simulate the blue blobs going down. And for sure, the Montreal group is like, if it's a red blob, it has buoyancy, it's going to tend to rise. The blue blob, it's a little denser, it's going to tend to sink. And so it's more like active convection. I think that's exactly it. So the um, yeah, well, um, true. And so Gernis likes to, is trying to look at hundred million year time scale, so you can't just roll it back because it does completely um, deviate. The uh, the Alex Forte and their group, Rob Muka, they'll limit their simulations to go back thirty million years because that's their threshold of when they feel like it's just become completely uncertain and they can't trust it any further because of the diffusion. I understand what you're saying in spirit with active and passive, but I, I would be a little careful. I mean, they're all active. They're all being, they're all responding to density anomalies that are all driving flow. Right? Mm -hmm. The question is, is the density anomaly the big one you need just the slab, or you do need something else? Right, right, so yes. I, passive. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's fair. No, I've heard it's been some geophysicists that have planted that uh, lingo in, in me. <laughs> I but, understand it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's a paper for their version of Colorado. Uh, yes. And it actually includes uh, a form as well. Uh, so up on form. So it's really, uh, like it's Rustin and, and I guess Edwin said, you know, it's, a, it's really about what kind of starting model you want to use, you know, some, how you treat this red you know, Do you really believe they're thermal or they're, or they're real? I mean, so. Yes. Uh, and some, the of, some of them probably are real. Some probably just size of the void. That is for sure, and there's no question that something like this is really pushing the resolution of what you can kind of try to do, because you're at the limit A of the adjoint inversion that was done to map uh, velocities into density, right? And it's very much at the resolution of the tomography they're using to drive the model. So, um, and yet, it seems to match 
pretty well with what's seen in the last three million years in that, uh, in that place. Um, I want to show you Jean Braun in the paper that we uh, first put out to discuss, which is partly about the Colorado. It has a really nice general um, treatment to understand why it is that you could get a big erosional and exhumational response even though you've got a fairly small perturbation. And um, this is that the answer is that even if the uplift rate of dynamic topography can be quite slow while you're building that topography, once it's there, it um, can be maintained by isostasy, right? Um, <clears throat> so if you erode something down, it's going to come right back. And the other thing is the plates are moving across it. So the velocity of uplift is the shape of that function as it's moving past you, right? So the faster it moves, you can get a very high uplift rate, even though it's not an intrinsically high uplift rate from, right? I think that makes sense to you. Here, if here's a blob of some uplifted topography and you're moving across it, this would be the uplift rate that you feel, right? Very simple little bit of math. And, right, so dynamic topography is, is typically static, right? Because you're going to be often in static equilibrium. You've got a dynamic force pushing up that will deflect the surface to be in balance with the gravitational stress back. So if you erode it off, you're out of balance, so it's going to pop right back, right? Up to a limit of how much the, the moho can uh, respond uh, kind of isostatically. But so what... what um, Jean has shown, which is really cool, if you start with this initial dynamic topography and slide it by, it actually gives you pretty fast uplifts as it's moving past. And if, if the erosion engine is strong enough to remove a lot of material during the time it's going past, you'll also get an isostatic rebound. So for a one kilometer uplift, you could potentially get seven kilometers of erosion. Right? If you're there long enough to keep isostatically renewing it. Because of that, he finds this really cool, it's just really simple math, but it's really cool. The, the funnest ones usually, that, that for the same amplitude, the bigger amplitude feature, you're going to get a lot more erosion, even though the slopes are less steep. Because it's there for longer as it goes by, and it has more time to do this kind of isostatic uh, reinforcement. That's pretty cool. This is an extra plot that wasn't in the paper. If you turn down your erosion coefficient to a lower number, of course, you don't have enough time. You don't do enough work to get isostatic rebound to anything, so nothing much happens while the thing sweeps by. So that's the critical question. Will your erosion do much on the kind of slopes that you get, um, get or not? But I think that brings us to the Colorado Plateau puzzle, and I think Becky will do the best job introducing this. So. Yes. So when, when we actually this, I was kind of curious about like, where you where, where you actually put the sediment. Uh, and there actually, there can be a very important zone. Right? So uh, yes. We're talking about like, two kilometer uh, sediment uh, over a very you know, large, you know, spatial uh, extent. Then they have to go somewhere. That actually, that itself is actually a big uh, sedimentary zone. So yes, that is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. In that model, it's a very simple model. The sediments just go away beyond the, beyond the model domain. So it's effectively like you dissolve the surface at the rate prescribed by that erosion rule. Um, I mean, yeah, so that's 60, 90, 66, right? He actually, he, he actually said something like, uh, you, uh, through this erosion, you couple it to the boundary convection, you may actually, that, that cycle, the sediment you, you wrote, you dump somewhere, that cycle may actually induce the boundary convection. Yeah, just, uh, you can see something mm. possible. Mm. You, you, mm. you dump mm. here, you dump here, yeah. like, that actually, you, you can form circulation. Yeah, that's cool. I'm not familiar with that one, though. I remember reading, I can't remember who it was, but a, an author in the 50s, before any ideas of plate tectonics were really out there, looking at the mass balance of continents and calculating how much was being eroded off of continents and knowing something about the duration the continents have been around, said there's a mass balance problem. We have to be recycling it back in somehow. And he had 
you know, he said there has to be some kind of conveyor bringing it back in. So he was right. But okay, very cool. I remember reading the paper. I couldn't remember who it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. For instance, John, right now one of the big things they have a project in um, Africa, where they're they're trying to model the dynamic topography evolution for where you have uplifts and where you have subsiding basins, and then they're eroding off of the highlands and into the basins, and they're trying to see if you can um, basically invert that geologic record for. Uh, Yes, yeah, and then, and then you keep track of it. But th this was just a really um, quick model to show you what could happen with the advecting of that, uh, that uplift. And also he was doing it to demonstrate how awesome his new model is, which is the fastest landscape evolution model that's ever been written. And he would be telling you about how he runs it on his MacBook Air and it does these incredible number of calculations. In a Anyway, it's, it's quite amazing what he's achieved. Oh, yeah. Shoot, I gotta grab my computer. Oh, we need a dongle. Yeah, I have one. All right, so um, there we go. All right, oh, sort of. Oh, I don't know if we can do, deal with that. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm, I'm, there we go. Man, that's weird. Yeah, it's like, it's this. I think it's there because it's. Oh, All right, awesome, thanks. All right, so Colorado Plateau. So there, um, so there's lots of controversy over the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado Plateau is, well, so as we all know, so it lies in sort of the interior of the uh, Cordilleran origin, and it's a, uh, it's very interesting in that um, I mentioned this earlier. So the Colorado Plateau, for a really long time, for about 500 million years, it was part of the stable North American craton, and then after about sometime after 80 million years ago it underwent about two kilometers of elevation gain to its modern elevations. And so if you, you know, stand here and look into the Grand Canyon, you can just simply see this record because you have all this long history of flat-lying sedimentary rocks that were deposited when the plateau was at sea level. And then at some point in time, the plateau came up and you carved that giant canyon. So um, there are a variety of questions that just the very presence of the Colorado Plateau raises. So Obviously, what caused this previously stable cratonic region to go up sometime after 80 million years ago? Um, 
Where did the source of buoyancy come from? Did it come from the crust, the lithospheric mantle, the asthenosphere, or some combination of the three? And then finally, um, how did this low relief plateau escape significant upper crustal strain when all the surrounding regions are dramatically deformed? The Rockies, the Basin and Range, and the Rio Grande Rift. And so this low relief landscape very much contrasts with the high topography of these surrounding regions. So there have been many different ideas proposed for how you might get elevation gain of the plateau. Okay, so we've got no shortage of mechanisms, possible mechanisms for this. And so you can sort of divide these into three um, different groups based on the predicted timing of uplift. So we have um, during the, just thinking about the overall sort of Western U.S. evolution and late Cretaceous early tertiary time, this is when we have severe and laramide con contraction during the proposed development of the laramide flat slab beneath Western U.S., in mid-tertiary time, we have the, the demise of the laramide flat slab. And then in the late tertiary time, we get all this regional extensional tectonism. And so there have been lots of models proposed in this early time frame. We have various dynamic models associated with uh, you know, evolution of the subducting slab, potentially crustal flow, chemical alteration of the lithosphere through volatile addition. In the mid-tertiary, again, we could partially remove the lithospheric mantle, we could de-densify it through magma extraction. We could warm it heterogeneously. In the late tertiary, there have been a variety of suggestions, essentially based around this idea that you have these hot asthenospheric upwellings, and then dynamic models that attempt to sort of quantify this dynamically. And so um, in the end, I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of mechanisms to possibly explain the plateau's origin. We've got lots of ways to get it high. The real problem is figuring out which one is the cause. And so one of the points here I think that is, um, is that just figuring out when the plateau went up is really key to determining why it went up. Because if we knew it all went up in the late Cretaceous, early tertiary, it would greatly narrow down the range of viable models. And I guess another thing I would just throw out in terms of sort of hopefully setting up a little bit of a discussion that we would have, in my view, I'm not sure that, I mean, if we want to think about testing dynamic models, sure that the Colorado Plateau is really the best place to do it, because the Colorado Plateau is really complicated, and the landscape there is very complicated. And so um, there are lots of ways to explain that elevation gain potentially without invoking dynamic mechanisms. Certainly dynamic mechanisms might have played a role. It's just really, I think, going to be a challenge to definitively test those models here, unlike some other locations where, um, like in the Cretonic interior, like along the east coast of North America, where you're kind of restricted as to what the mechanisms might be. So... Right, so I was just going to spend a few minutes um, just sort of setting up the, the geology of the southwestern portion of the plateau and then talk about some of the constraints, the actual hard constraints we have on the timing of uplift and on roofing, and then talk about some of the thermochronology constraints that we have on the regional unroofing history. And so um, uh, most of the evidence for when the Colorado Plateau became elevated um, is based on observations that have been made in the southwestern portion of the Colorado Plateau here, where we have the Grand Canyon. Okay, and so now I'm just going to zoom in to a simplified geologic map of this region. So here's our simplified map. So here's the edge of the plateau. So here's the plateau. Here's uh, the basin and range, the transition zone into the basin and range. Um, and so a couple of things to note is that, of course, the Colorado River currently flows westward through this region to its current exit here at the western margin of the plateau at Grand Wash, um, Grand Wash Cliff. And, of course, here it's inside the Grand Canyon, which in places is up to a mile deep. Um, right, that was and so next I'll, I just want to highlight, so we have this cross section here going from southwest to northeast through the plateau. So here we're on the plateau, here we're to the southwest in the basin and range. And so um, you can see this overall uh, picture here. So we've got the Precambrian basement overlined by Paleozoic units and then the underlying strata. And so here I'm just showing cross-section through the eastern Grand Canyon and the, the western Grand Canyon. And so um, we can just sort of remove, and so this is um, exaggerated by 25 times. So in reality, all the, the slopes here are extremely small. I mean, they're like one degree across the plateau. Now if we uh, just sort of remove this strain just to sort of set up this problem uh, a little bit in terms of thinking about the erosional history, so, so um, again, the Grand Canyon has incised through the Paleozoic section, sections and in places has hit the Precambrian basement. 
Um, but interestingly, um, further to the north, there are these thick seek packages of um, Mesozoic um, strata that are still preserved. So these are um, units that are exposed, for example, in Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon National Park. And it's long been proposed that these sedimentary units that are preserved in the interior of the plateau once extended much further south over the southwestern part of the plateau where the Grand Canyon occurs. And so, um, uh, so there are some interesting questions then that arise about how does this sort of regional unroofing story relate to the timing of Grand Canyon incision and the timing of regional plateau uplift. And so I just wanted to um, hit on what are the hard constraints that we have on uplift and unroofing of the Colorado Plateau. So um, in late Cretaceous time, we know the plateau is at sea level because of the widespread occurrence of um, late Cretaceous marine strata. Um, and then we have a couple hard constraints on uplift, and then we have a variety of constraints on unroofing. And again, it's really hard to get at uplift histories. So nobody agrees on when uplift happened is the problem. I remember Thorsten saying yesterday that um, something like what you, it would be nice to know if we knew something about uplift rates, then we could, I don't know, maybe begin to test some of these models. But it's really hard for us to get at uplift rates. This is a really challenging problem. So a couple hard constraints we have on, on uplift. So here we're looking at the edge of the plateau. Um, one thing that we know is that we've had drainage reversal that happened at some point in the past along the plateau rim. So currently, the basin and range is lower than the Colorado Plateau. But in fact, we know, uh, every, everyone agrees, that the basin and range used to be higher than the plateau. And we know this because there are these big paleo canyons that drain northeastward onto the plateau. These things are huge. They're like, they've got like 1,200 meters of relief on them. They're kind of like small grand canyons. Like they're, they're big canyons. And everybody agrees that these things are late Cretaceous to early tertiary in age based on the age of um, gravels that occur within them. And these gravels record northeastward transport on the plateau. So that tells us, again, we definitely know that uh, um, the basin and range used to be higher, which tells us that the Colorado Plateau went up relative to the basin and range. But we don't actually know, did the Colorado Plateau go up or did the basin and range go down? OK, second thing is carving of the Grand Canyon. So when was the Grand Canyon carved? Because obviously, if you, in order to get carving of a canyon that's like a mile deep, you need to have uplift that has occurred by that time. Well, as you may know, there is no consensus on this issue at all. This whole the Grand Canyon problem is a very, very interesting one. So as I mentioned, of course, the, Grand Can the Colorado River currently flows westward through this region. And it turns out, um, so the prevailing view um, Okay, I guess I should back up. So there's hard evidence, I guess, that we did not have an integrated west-flowing Colorado River that is sort of in its modern configuration until after 6 million years ago. Everybody agrees on that. Because prior to that time, um, there is, are no um, uh, sort of Colorado plateau-derived sediments that are preserved in Grand Wash Trough sitting out here. And suddenly after 6 million years, all this stuff suddenly appears. Yes? Well, that's an excellent question. We do not know. <laughs> that's the big problem. I mean, we don't know where it went. Oh, so w before this, where did the river go? Okay. And we don't know. Nobody knows. That's like the a key part of the debate. So before you integrated the river, where did it actually flow? And there have been lots of, um, I don't know if I, I don't think I have a slide here to show this, but there have been lots of directions prior to integration that people have proposed, like pretty much anything you can think of. People have suggested it went that way. People have suggested, ah, maybe it went that way. They suggested, ah, maybe it went that way or that way. Pretty much there's any direction that you want the river to have flowed, somebody suggested it as a model, because we just don't know. So the water must have gone somewhere. Um, I mean, we have ideas. <laughs> Everybody's got their favorite model. So yeah, so where did the river flow before, and how did it become um, integrated. Um, so, uh, I mean, as some of you may know, I just recently published a, a paper based on some new appetite data that we have from the bottom of the western Grand Canyon, suggesting that this part of the Grand Canyon may be as old. Um, much of it might have been carved as old as 70 million years ago. And um, uh, this um, actually an, an interpretation of an ancient Grand Canyon, that's an idea that's been around for actually some time. 
Um, but certainly recently, the prevailing view has been that it's been carved in the last six million years. But I'm not going to really get into the whole Grand Canyon controversy today because I think it sort of gets us maybe a little bit off track for what we want to cover today. But anyway, if we knew when the, obviously, carving of the Grand Canyon, uh, if we knew when it was carved, that could place, a, that obviously places an important constraint on when the plateau went up. But that's a highly controversial topic. All right, so constraints on unroofing. We have some stratigraphic constraints that I'll just, uh, that um, I'm, I'm mainly going to just point out for the sake of at the end here, I'm just going to show you a model that we have for the unroofing history of the plateau. And these stratigraphic constraints are really important for putting into that model. So, for example, um, we, there's some Cretaceous that is sitting. Oh, okay, I should use this. So here's our cross section through here. So further to the north here, we've got Pale Triassic Jurassic section. Um, sitting on top of the Paleozoics, and then on top of that, the Cretaceous. Over here on the edge of the plateau, the Cretaceous is actually sitting right on top of the Paleozoics. So that tells us that there must have been some major erosional event here um, prior to deposition of the Cretaceous, because the Cretaceous is cut out. Um, so that's a really important constraint on the erosion history. Again, I mentioned we have these tertiary rim gravels, which are sitting right on top of uh, the Paleozoics here. Um, which again is, tells us that we must have been to the surface by the time we deposited those units. And then the third important constraint, we have this Beta Hochi formation, which is mostly a lacustrian and volcanic unit, interbedded unit, and that's 16 to 6 million years old. It sits directly on some of the Mesozoic sediments, and so that tells us you must have been at the surface there by the time you deposited those units. And so, um, again, this just um, comes, becomes important when we begin to put together our, our sort of model at the end um, of the talk, because these are really key constraints on the unroofing history. Okay, and then the thermochronology results. So um, there have been previously published appetite fission track data that has um, um, work that's been done in this region. And um, pretty much most of that work has been, f has been focused on the bottom of the canyon, um, where Proterozoic basement is exposed, so down here in the canyon bottom. And this is because the temperature sensitivity of the appetite fission track method is somewhat higher than the helium method. So in order to obtain a really useful constraint on the cooling history, you pretty much have to go as deep as possible. When you go up higher, you haven't completely like reset the system, so you obtain less useful information. And so um, based on those results, it um, appeared that things cooled earlier <laughs> here and um, at a later time here, indicating an overall progression of unroofing um, uh, in this direction. Um, so older dates here, younger here, you have unroofing that's progressing towards the plateau interior. And so recently, um, uh, uh, there's actually been uh, quite a bit of euthorium helium work now done in this region. Um, these are results of a, a paper that I, I, I published now back in uh, 2008, and I'm going to mostly spend the rest of the time here talking about the regional and roofing story that came out of that work. There's also been a, a paper that was just published this year that also um, by Lee et al., uh, Danny Stockley's group, um, and um, that has a lot more data. Actually, I think most of that data is entirely, entirely consistent with our results. They have more data from the interior of the plateau, but that whole interior of the plateau story, you're just, just the young... Um, you just see a young signal, which I think is just related to drainage river integration. So I'm just going to mainly present, I'm just going to present my results, which I think is uh, representative of, of sort of the larger data set I think that's available to us now. So um, the nice thing about the euthorium helium system is that, of course, you're sensitive to lower temperatures. So um, we then went out there and we worked on samples not only from the bottom of the canyon, so you can look at this cross-section here. But I also worked on samples from all across the plateau surface because fortunately there are detrital appetites that occur, for example, in the Triassic Moenkopi formation that we can act, have really nice appetites that we can analyze. And so this allows me to actually pepper the whole surface of the plateau here and gain sort of a, a, a larger sort of a three-dimensional picture of what the unroofing history looked like across this region over time. And I guess the, um, the key result is that that history is actually... Um, kind of complicated, or at least it's a, there's, there's a very clearly a, a, a multi-phase cooling history um, that occurs on the southwestern portion of the plateau. And so what we detect from these data are that we see um, three um, main unroofing phases that are separated by intervals when the landscape is relatively stable, at least within the limits of our, you know, of our method. So um, here, um, I'm just showing you sort of the, the results of our interpretations. I'm not going to go through all of the data, but um, each one of these gray locations is a place, is one of our sample locations. And here I'm just showing you 
um, the results of our thermal history simulations when um, we think this uh, surface cooled below a temperature of about 45 degrees C. So here, so this is this, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, this is this blue surface here, this is the Kaibab surface. And so I'm, I'm showing the time at which this surface cooled to temperatures less than um, 45 degrees C. And so what we see is, are these three different phases of unroofing. We see uh, older dates here going to younger dates this way, which appears that there is a regional uh, phase of um, northwest to southeastward unroofing that's happening across this entire region. For example, maybe associated with tilting of the plateau in that direction. Um, then we have sort of an interval where we don't see many ages, and then we see a younger phase of mid-tertiary unroofing that happens 20, sort of 28 to 16 million years that progresses inwards towards the plateau. Then sort of another sort of time where we don't see a lot of results. A lot of, we, we don't seem to see a signal. And then a late tertiary signal less than 6 million years, which is very pronounced here, that I think is associated probably with integration of the Colorado River. And that, I think, is the signal that pretty much John Lee is seeing in the entire interior of the plateau. So it's really when you're only getting to this very edge of the plateau that you're seeing, I think, an interesting signal that is maybe reflective of some of the larger tectonic processes. So I've just got two more slides here to sort of summarize some of this information. And so um, what we did then was to uh, sort of combine these new thermochronology data with the stratigraphic constraints and the other geologic information to develop a, a roofing model for this part of the plateau. And so this is just sort of a simplified version of this. So again, this is a cross section from off the plateau here onto the plateau. Um, again, a cross section in which we've removed the strain. And so the green is the modern topography. And here I've just reconstructed what the past topography we think would have looked like at these different snapshots in time um, based on the thermochronology data. And so, um, and then I'll just put up the slide and just sort of tell you a little bit about what we think might be going on here. So we think um, here's our overall unroofing model for these different snapshots. So again, this is along the same cross-section line. So again, here's our present day basin and range, call it a plateau. And so 80 million years ago, um, this is when we get um, maximum burial. We know we're below sea level at that time, so we have the deposition of this thick package of marine sedimentary rocks. Then the Laramide happens. Um, so this is when you, we think you, know, you have development of the flat slab, and a lot of action happens in that time frame. Um, we know that at this time, again, based on these um, paleo canyons and those rim gravels, that this region was higher to the south than it is to the north. And so we have a lot of structural relief. We get this big regional unroofing episode. Based on my data, I actually think now that there's actually much of at least the Western Grand Canyon was incised at that time, but um, that's a topic of debate. <laughs> um, but uh, we get this big regional unroofing signal. Um, then we have an interval of uh, uh, sort of stability. Um, sometime after this, we get an interval of a drainage reversal. This is when we know, again, at some point, what the basin and range used to be higher than the plateau, then things reversed. Um, so now the Colorado Plateau is higher and the river systems reversed into the opposite direction. When exactly that happens is, and how exactly that happens, I think is, is a little bit of an open question. An interesting thing is that this is associated with the time when people think is, you have sort of the onset of the demise of the Laramide Flat Slab. We don't actually see a major unroofing signal at this time, which is kind of interesting. Then between 25 and 16, we have another major unroofing phase that progresses inwards across the plateau. And at this time, we're sort of suggesting that maybe this occurs sort of in scarp retreat in the manner that we sort of have the modern scarps across the region. That's just an idea. And then, um, we again, we have another interval of stability, and then we have the present day configuration. And um, in this time, we integrate the modern Colorado River, and this is when you appear to suck a whole bunch of stuff off of the interior of the plateau. So again, essentially, we have these three major intervals of unroofing, what happens in the Laramide, um, what happens um, between 25 and 16, and then what happens after integration of the, the Colorado River. It's also kind of interesting that um, between 16 and 6, this is when the whole basin and range is opening, and actually it doesn't look like we're seeing much signal of that on the plateau. Um, so there's a, a variety of, so again, it's sort of a, 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 a not a necessary, there's a lot going on with the different sort of patterns of unroofing that I think we're able to tease out pretty well with the thermochronology data. And that's, um, I think that's pretty much it for my overview there. Yeah, Cinti. Um, so right now the Colorado River goes into the Gulf of California. Yeah. I just don't know. When, when did the Gulf of California go? Five million years ago? Yeah, five, uh, 
six-ish. I mean, that, so that is what could be the driver for integrating the river. Yeah, that's the idea. The river? Yeah. When you, when you have the drainage, right after you train, uh, reverse the drainage, then it went to the Pacific. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm asking you. Uh, well, no, no, no. I mean, those are good questions. There, um, I mean, there's no consensus on that. I mean, I could. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so the question is. Uh, well, so, I mean, no one, again, nobody agrees about where the rivers went before. There are a variety of models for where it went. I mean, so, you know, for example, one could argue, for example, there's one camp that says, well, most of the uplift is young, right? So I should have put this slide in there. Um, where uh, river integration is associated with carving of the canyon. And so, essentially, this reflects when you pop the plateau up. And that's when you have most of the elevation gain. So, for example... Uh, the Karlstrom camp. They strongly believe in young uplift. And an alternative camp <laughs> um, says, well, a lot of that uplift is probably, could be much older, might be as old as the Laramide, and that this major signal of unroofing that you're seeing is merely when you open the Gulf of California and you integrate the river and you just suddenly have a chance to suck stuff off the plateau. And, of course, there's a whole com combination of ways in which you could have uplift that happens in several pulses, and that it could be spatially heterogeneous. If, I mean, one option, for example, so if one wants to think about where, yeah, so at any rate, so we've got these big paleo canyons, which are not actually sketched on here, but they are draining in this direction. And there are um, some basins up here that people suggest are depot centers from stuff that's draining um, from here. And, you know, if you had, again, I didn't put any slides in really here about this, but um, in terms of my recent data where I, I, I think our data is saying that we've got substantial carving of the Western Canyon as old as 70 million years ago, well, that, in that scenario, we must have had the river systems flowing in this direction because everything was higher here at this time and everything was lower out here, in which case the simplest interpretation then is that those river systems would have been draining out essentially towards sea level over in this direction. And that subsequently, as you're sort of changing the landscape and this thing, areas to the east rise up and areas over here collapse, that you subsequently have a subsequent drainage reversal as the topography evolves. Um, but again, I, there's not any consensus about where the river went before and what deposits are associated with it. Mm -hmm. So you might Uh, well, in terms of the history that we see here, I mean, it's kind of interesting that, um, I'm not sure which slide to use here, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, overall, in this time frame that we're looking at, you, you clearly have northeastward tilting of the plateau. So it's clearly getting ramped up like this. And that's based just if you look at the erosional patterns, you erode the deepest over here. And you have much thicker sequences preserved over here. And we can see that signal in the helium data. Um, we can see it in the depositional patterns, actually, even earlier in the Cretaceous signal. So it actually looks like this thing has tilted up in that direction several times in the past. Yeah. Which is actually something that some of the dynamic models, like the Lou et al. model, really key in on. It key, seems to key in on in terms of arguing that their model can explain the sort of northeastward tilt of the plateau, and in that way it's consistent with our results. So, so, so the range is subsiding then, or how do you explain the Yeah, so after, yeah, so in the Laramide, you appear to be, well, you're tilting sort of in this direction. Subsequently, yeah, you have to have the basin and range start to collapse, so you begin to reverse backwards. Okay. How exactly that happens, there is sort of a record in some paleo canyons over here where they actually seem to have a pretty good record of, sort of depositional record of that that reversal, but the problem is in this time interval, there's actually not much, like there aren't 
there isn't much aggregation going on in the plateau, so the record's like gone. So it's actually sort of cryptic, that time interval in the mid-tertiary, like what is exactly is going on here and how does that reversal occur? But that is broadly when it looks like the basin and range locally begins to sort of open it up. Yeah. Here? Mm -hmm. So do you agree on that? Do I agree? That the area that is uplifting more recently is the one on the side of the where the volcanoes Um so I guess my view, my view is that um so I think based on the helium data that we have from the canyon, I think we have evidence for um, substantial carving of, of parts of the canyon in the laramide. And so that could, if you figure, you know, we have kilometer scale incision of the canyon at that time, that would imply kilometer scale uplift of this part of the plateau. If you're tilting it, it doesn't necessarily mean the whole plateau has to go up. It's possible it did. But I also am open to there being younger uplift phases because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on at younger times. So I'm not opposed to there being a younger late tertiary phase of uplift in addition to the older one that we're seeing. I think it's almost like, you know, it's oversimplified to think of the whole thing going up and down like some big piston, you know? Like, I think it's probably complicated in space and in time. So it's just really hard to get at that. <laughs> um. I think Callan is going to... You know, there he is. <laughs> I can show you one more slide. We can talk about these uh, different model predictions. Right, so that paints out what the problem is. You know, people get pretty interested in it. There's so many people go and see the Grand Canyon every year, right? And it's a great showcase of, of geologic history. Right? You can walk down the Grand Canyon and walk through two billion years of time, pretty much, from little quaternary sediments on the top to the one point, uh, are they 1.8, the uh, basement there, something like that, right? So that, that's a pretty stunning amount of time, right? If you stop and think about it just for a minute, how old is the, um, the Earth? 1.5 billion, whatever Sam would know exactly. But, uh, even the universe since the Big Bang is like 14 billion years. So you've got a six or a seven of the history since the Big Bang during the Grand Canyon. Now, most of it's missing these erosion intervals, but uh, it's kind of astounding to think about. So, anyway, so it's a big deal to try to understand the Grand Canyon, I think, just because of that public awareness. But so here's the, um, the issue with all these models, which are, I think they're really cool that we're starting to think about how motion in the mantle is really expressed in the, in the geologic record and even the geomorphic record. That's really um, an exciting time to get to. And um, here's the uplift history by the, the Lou and Gernis model, which is uh, published in Geology in 2010. There are a couple of papers um, from this work. And on this side is the uh, Rob Lucas paper from uh, 2009 in GRL. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities in what they're trying to do. As we talked a little bit, they have to make some choices of which way you're going to go, what approximations you're going to make, and what you're going to um, believe in. But, um, so here, let me just walk through this um, of uh, uh, Li Zhang's model. This is the topography increment in some period of time. I don't know what period of time. But just think of this as the uplift rate. Um, and then these are curves of the actual topography over time. So maybe those are easier to look at. And he's got different models for exactly um, what parameter sets you're going to use. So let's not worry about that. They're all showing basically the same thing. So it's a period of subsidence, right, during the Cretaceous, which is really good. That's your accommodation space to pile up all this stuff. So there might slap pulling it down. And then this climb all the way up, and it either terminates here or there, but either way, something like all of the uplift of the plateau is accomplished by 40 million years ago. Okay? And then it's just up and it holds steady. The integration happens at 6. That's when a bunch of the you know, sun exhibition kicks in around 30. But then it finally cut the cane. Where it finally exhumes all the rest of the stuff from the interior of the 
plateau since 10 or since 6. But that would be some kind of delay long after that, that up, right? And so when we talk about where did the Colorado River go, also depend what was the Colorado River, right? Um, it didn't exist as a river from the ocean all the way up to its headwaters until um, right about 6. That's known pretty well. The sediment suddenly shows up. The water suddenly shows up, and you can watch it go further and further downstream. Um, that's a really cool story that's been pieced together. Where it went before, did it exist before, right? So you can find the upper Colorado to about Grand Junction has, has developed as a system draining out by 11. But did it end in the lake? Did it go somewhere? Nobody knows, right? Exactly the same. But, so, this model, no uplift since 40. This model, they run it differently. They can only look at the last 30 million years. But in that last 30 million years, <coughs> they see a kilometer of uplift of the plateau from the dynamics part. So they're like making dead opposite predictions. These guys say, yeah, you're probably right about substance, the layer line, and then bouncing up after that. It's all early. We can't simulate with our model. We're not worried about that. But the time period they overlap they're opposite. Oh, you can't hear me? I'm usually pretty loud. No, 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 they can hear you. I can't hear you. Oh. Oh, yeah. None of that was recorded. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know what happened. So I'd like to know which modeling approach or which model to look at or, I mean, does it mean that we just have no idea and it could have been any time or can we fight it out a little bit? Which, which one should we believe more in the last 30 million years where they overlap? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, that's another question. Yeah. And then they run convection backward in time. So then, uh, you know, if you read that paper, then you can see then 30 million years ago, actually that, that now the pancake, the seismic is all became a boom. Um, so I, I guess I, an interesting question will be for the students will be, now we have this uh, much better, res you know, high resolution seismic model for, for the region. Uh, presumably, you guys can take a look at what is the more updated seismic model to see for that structure. Was still there. You know, that SARS was so bombing. I do. I see, that was the key to, to, to uh, the bomb features model. I mean, if you see if that, uh, I don't know which figure, if you don't know, you can show. Yeah, I mean, I. Really, that, you know, if you, uh, if you kind of take the physics that you guys learned from our discussion, you know, convection model, then you ask, uh, now you can actually analyze the problem yourself, really. That's what I'm saying. You, do, you look at what's going on in their model, what actually caused the object, it's actually quite clear. Yeah, so first we can see from their model, this is the 2009 paper of uh, Rob Muka. So right, you're starting from the present, where you have this uh, low velocity anomaly right here, and then you roll it backwards, right? And it's, it is a, a full global model, right? So it's not just this little region, but you can see that little piece move back, roll back, down, and it, you know, it's down pretty deep underneath the EPR. At 25 million years ago, right? So he's saying that's the convective cell rolling around underneath the uh, East Pacific rise. And the East Pacific rise goes underneath the, the continent, and you have this wave. So it's low, starts coming up, starts coming up, and you watch this wave of uplift come across that then tilts the plateau in that direction, right? So that's what they see. That's what you were just describing. Yes. I'm kind of curious. Shiji highlighted the way these models work. It's a little weird. Um, the present day becomes the initial condition, right? Yes, you run backwards. Yeah. But that initial condition, you can change it. Yeah. You'll get a different start. That's so, right. Um, it might become dependent completely on that initial 
Right. So here, here's a figure from Thorsten's last. Um, But it would be interesting, maybe it's a good exercise for the students to run this one back in time. Hmm? But uh, um, is there, when, when I look at these, I, I, don't, I don't know whether this trick of Rob's was a great thing to do or not. So I've been focusing on looking on this side. And, and to me, you know, these two seem almost the same. There's little differences in details, but it's kind of the same story. And wouldn't you say that? Other than resolving uh, Yellowstone, if you run a low-pass filter on this, it might look roughly like either one of those. Is that not true? That, that is true, but it's a very different interpretation if you worry about things like the color of the Yeah, absolutely. That's where the... So Colorado Plateau is, it sounds like what you're saying is that the Colorado Plateau is too regional. No, what to, I'm saying is I... some global scale, this one is saying I like nothing comes up since 40, and this one says a kilometer since 30, right? So that's...
So, um, right, so the, the big thing that's not um, being expressed in this model is that low velocity zone that's in the upper few hundred kilometers that in the, in the MUCA model is this one that um, Shiji was just talking, right? That's this guy. If you, if you roll that thing backwards in time, it rolls back underneath the EPR, right? So they're, they are seeing that roll in. That's the whole thing that they're seeing. Forget all the details. They're seeing an uplift since 30 that more or less coincides with the North America overriding the EPR. And they're treating that as an, an, an active sort of buoyancy that's rolling up and underneath. And so that is not happening in the, uh, the Lou and Gurness model, right? N none of this action. Is, so if you didn't treat this as buoyant and roll it back in time, it's not going to happen, right? Yeah, you use but so I don't know exactly what happened in their model that well, you, you don't do see this at all. And where was it? Yeah. Ah, I see. So it, it comes up higher and it comes to younger, but then it's over by 25. Anyway, so it sounds like maybe uh, simulating in time with the new data embedded in a global model might be a productive thing to do, right? Now, there are many groups that are working at that kind of more regional scale with more detailed dynamic topography models, right? For example, you mentioned at the beginning of your uh, discussion about what is the U.S. Uh, I guess the Gurney's model tends to be kind of broad, uh, long wavelength, so uh, I think it's not surprising that Gurney's model couldn't really catch that, you know, nice, you know, oh. small scale variation of coast, you know, sort of the coastline variations. Whereas I think in there maybe Alex Foch's model actually works much better because they actually got the short wave and that looks like actually a very good test right here. The coastline variation look, looks like a very good test to their model. So I guess really, I mean, it's, I guess, you know, there are places where, you know, their model might be might work better, you know, uh, and there are other places maybe. Not as good uh, because the size of your model is not as good. Uh, I think, the, but I, I think the bottom line for students is really, I think the, the physics that we learned uh, in the last few days about the convection, uh, they are actually all the same physics. Okay? I mean, the good thing is that you guys, if you learn that physics, you can actually analyze the result yourself. You can see the, you can see the paper like, uh, like, a, you know, like a, how the person sees the paper, how we see the, we see the paper. Basically, kind of evolve this kind of expert kind of work. thing. This one? Yeah. So yeah. this experiment can redo with the software that we did in the original one. I think that we, we had an exercise. 
Right, right. That would be cool. <laughs> How do you go from seismic velocities to, to density? And then, yeah. I mean, and everybody's using the same method, or there are different methods? No, but the interesting part is that it's, of course, not trivial at all. And it's not a, it's, at some level, it's not a solved question. On, on another hand, we have molecular physics constraints, we have global geo constraints, and so on. So what I've done here is I've just multiplied everything with a fixed number, which is ridiculous. But when you look at the top two figures, they don't look too different from what Robert, Robert Mucha did. And he has a whole inversion mechanism where there's compositional variations all over the mantle that make this much more complicated. But it just turns out because the sensitivity to the top layers is so strong that he happened to not include some compositional counterbalance in those layers, so we get basically the same result. I didn't quantify this, but just looks very simple. Okay. Yeah, I please. I bring it back to something that got lost, and it was the first thing Becky said, and I thought it was a great point. I mean, modeling is a choice. The first thing you choose is what to model, and that choice involves, do you have enough information, do you know enough of what's going on, or do you not? bad choice. It's not ready to model. Size of wave conversions, melting in the region, all these things. That, that's, maybe it's as simple as that. Hmm. The conversion of size and velocity here to density is not trivial because we have partial melt. Hmm. That's where we don't go around modeling hmm. everything. Yes. Right. We don't so, this is a very good point. And for example, you know, it may just not work out at all is along the, uh, the Yellowstone right, track. For example. Yeah. So we don't necessarily There's a big dome in the middle there, yeah. overall. So it's, if you to take a simplistic view of interpreting the regional geographic model, you don't get that. Hmm. It could be radial and hmm. trading off with us. If I could just throw one thing up here that's caught my eye to see what this is. Too simplistic. This is like what a geomorphologist would think looking at something like this. But this is your... Um, uh, Non-isostatic topography, right? So it takes crust 2.0 and assume a simple density structure and calculate what the topography should be isostatically. And this is the difference between that and etopo 2, right? So same kind of stuff we were looking at the other day. Um, and so the main thing you see, of course, are the mid-ocean ridges, right? Those big highs, and that's understood. That's the decay of uh, topography with the square root of time, right? So this is the hot asthenosphere underneath here. But the thing that really catches my eye is that you can see the EPR still right underneath the western US. Right? It's active spreading is going on here. It's going on there on the uh, uh, Juan Fuca Ridge, Gorda Ridge. Um, and yeah, subduction is is over when you hit and you get the San Andreas Fault and the Laramide slab starts dropping away. But everything that was under the EPR is still there, right? It's not going to thermally diffuse on this time scale. So it seems to me that there's something that should be really robust that over the last 30 million years, you're coming over this source of buoyancy and you should be going up. Of course, the basin range is extending, so your net is perhaps down of the surface through there. But um, anyway, that, that's how it looks to me, just at that very gross scale. And at some level, that's what I think, for right or wrong, that's what Rob Mucha's model is picking up, is the coming over the top of that, um, that high of the EPR. And then the details are on how you treat that and how it evolves over time. But anyway. It, it just really struck me, like, amazingly the first time I saw that image. I don't know. I've, please. To run the convection backwards, do you actually have to do a global calculation, or it's just some finite size box? Uh, if you do a finite size box, you just got to make sure that you're not determining things that are going up and down in the size just because they can't be each box. Far, far enough away from the box, it's fine. With a caveat, you know, that it's 
In the back, yeah. So, geologic constraints, what about the volcanoes? There's a tremendous amount of salt in volcanoes, which to us is a powerful mantle signal. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you incorporate the, the igneous record into the The people always seem to be along the edge of the public. Yeah. Yeah, the, most of it is around the edges, right? It keeps flickering in and eating in a little closer through time. Um, we certainly open up a slab window either way, but uh, I, I was really meaning the um, that wealth of hot asthenosphere that's underneath the EPR. That is overridden, right? Even if you whatever you do with the details of the of the ridge crest. No, but even if it's not active upwelling, it's it's there, right? So then you got to wait for it to thermally diffuse. At least that, that's my very. I, I'm out of my depth. I will, <laughs> I'll admit that. But I've had people tell me, no, there's nothing happened. There's no inertia in the mantle. So once you stop that subduction, it's all over. And it doesn't seem like to me that that's uh, possible. Seeing as you have active spreading range subduction to the south, active spreading range subduction still going on to the north, it seems like that whole, you can't just turn off that convective cell, seems to me. But, but either way, that overriding the high. Anyway, you could look at that image and just ask yourself if it's, if it's real or what it means, but um, it's striking visually. But, and I think this is what uh, we were just talking about right here, right? That rim of red around the plateau is coincident more or less with where the volcanism is around the, around the plateau. But, Yeah. Yeah. And, 
Right. And we know it's a complicated area, right? There's ideas that the, the whole, uh, you've dripped off the bottom of the Sierra Nevada and just three, five million years ago. So I don't know where people are standing on that idea these days. But uh, um, it's definitely a complicated zone where lots is happening in that uh, lithosphere. All right, I think we're uh, probably ready for our coffee break, yeah? yeah.